So welcome everyone to the system seminar series. Uh, we're excited to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Miret Kachira from uh, the University of Arizona. Um, so I'll give a quick bio and then uh, let Miret take the floor. Uh, Dr. Miret Kachira is the director of the Controlled Environment Agriculture Center and a professor in the Department of Biosystems Engineering at the University of Arizona. Uh, he received his PhD uh, MS in, and an MS uh, in food, agricultural, and biological engineering from The Ohio State University. Uh, his BS is in agricultural engineering from Kukurova University in Turkey. Uh, and Murat's primary focus is on the resource use efficiency of systems through integrated crop and production system sensing, monitoring, alternative energy, and environmental control applications. University of Arizona Urban Agriculture Vertical Farming Facility is an integral part of his research programs on indoor agriculture. He interacts with stakeholders through technical consultations, organizing and presenting in crop production and engineering short courses with hands-on ed educational workshops and grower conferences, and presenting at national and international conferences. He's a member of the American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers, the American Society of Horticultural Sciences, and the International Society for Horticultural Sciences. Um, so with that, uh, will that, uh, Murat take the floor? Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I, uh, I really appreciate the, 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 uh, the kind uh, introduction. And I would like to also thank uh, uh, my colleague, thank you for the invitation uh, to join you for this uh, seminar today. And also thanks to uh, Briona Boylan, uh, the coordinator, uh, helping us uh, uh, with our preparations uh, towards today's uh, seminar series. Uh, I am really excited to be with you today and then talk a little bit about our uh, program activities uh, here in my lab, as well as at the uh, Controlled Environment Agriculture Center facilities. Um, well, I, want, I must say that I know I have known uh, my colleagues here, Neil Madsen, for more than 15 years as part of our uh, controlled environment agriculture uh, collaborations in as well as USDA uh, Committee on uh, Controlled Environment Ag uh, Agriculture Technology and Use. And I recently had the opportunity to meet uh, and start our collaborations with uh, Dr. Fenke Yu. So I'm really excited uh, about this uh, collaboration opportunities. Uh, we had also a chance to uh, have a meeting with Michael Eaton. We were kind of discussing about uh, potential collaborations around uh, resources optimization and uh, in vertical farming systems. Um, hopefully, I will have another opportunity to, to join you and to learn from uh, your activities and your research programs, uh, especially from our graduate students and, and what you're working on. So I am with the Controlled Environment Agriculture Center here at the University of Arizona. I joined to this program and to my home department, Biosystems Engineering, back in 2007. Uh, I'm a professor in the Biosystems Engineering Department, and I assumed the directorship position as, uh, back in 2018. I have the privilege of working with a excellent group of faculty, staff, and students, and our volunteers here at the Controlled Environment Agriculture Center uh, with the same mission, really focused on uh, innovating, collaborating, educating uh, our students and the next generation leaders of this industry and academia in terms of food production in controlled environments. Um, as you all know, we are together in this grand uh, challenge, in these grand challenges as we know that the population is increasing and it will further increase. And with changing diets, people's diets are changing and we need to make sure that we will keep our people happy and healthy. We know that we are limited in terms of our accessibility to limited amount of resources, uh, land and water, uh, for us to be able to produce greater amount of food to feed people. Uh, the arable lands are declining. And we also are facing this challenge in terms of the outdoor climates, which is really dynamic. Uh, and it is uh, with ex unexpected climate changes, really pressuring our growers, especially those in the field and outdoor uh, settings. So we have to come up with uh, a different strategy and adaptation to against these challenges 
as we aim to produce more with less amount of resources. So we really need to consider integrated complementary systems, food production systems, with smarter production agriculture systems uh, as we face these challenges. And there will be a collaborative uh, nature of that uh, production with uh, produce and crops uh, grown in outdoor conditions. But I really believe that uh, controlled environment agriculture uh, with greenhouses and indoor vertical farming based systems or other types of indoor agriculture systems playing a significant role as we uh, address to these challenges in terms of food production and also with the optimal resource use uh, for food production in controlled environments. So the controlled environment agriculture is an innovative method of growing plants with integration of engineering as well as plant sciences and environmental controls that assures us uh, it creates an environment for optimal uh, aerial and root zone environment uh, with focus on food production again, with benefits such as predictable crop yield and timing, consistently available produce with high quality and quantity, and with improved uh, and high resources efficiency, with no pesticide use, and minimum environmental with minimum environmental impact. When we talk about controlled environment agriculture, uh, we see that there are various technology levels with low tech, uh, high tunnel type greenhouses with no uh, automation or uh, mechanization around it for seasonal extension. There are also medium tech greenhouses, but a greenhouse system can be really high tech in terms of full automation and, and environmental controls. We may see greenhouses on the ground, sometimes on the uh, rooftops, especially in urban uh, settings uh, with urban and peri-urban uh, uh, settings and deployments. But we also uh, see that uh, uh, indoor vertical farms uh, are also another technology level with almost full control around the environments that we try to uh, control and manage. Uh, greenhouse technologies and its industry uh, have been around for many, many decades in, in US as well as in North America and around the world. Uh, its technology, uh, the industry, its profitability have been proven. So, and this uh, sector is also growing uh, with new systems and technologies, innovation around it, and it will continue to grow. Uh, the vertical farming based systems and technologies are fast evolving. So this technology platform and its industry will continue to evolve. And that's where we have a lot of uh, research ongoing in terms of the science of crop production, uh, crop production and plant production, as well as engineering and technology development to support this uh, industry moving forward. In any type of agricultural production system, the focus must be on resources efficiency. So the resources efficiency is referring to basically what we're able to grow with yield outcome, but also sometimes quality attributes that we're expecting from that production versus how much resource we use. And this resource input can be water, nutrients, labor, or electrical energy. And, and we can separate those and be able to quantify resource use efficiency in terms of water use efficiency, nutrient use efficiency, um, electrical use efficiency, and such and such. So we can use this as a metric, the most appropriate metric when we compare one agricultural system to another, field versus greenhouse versus indoor vertical farm-based systems. If you look at the uh, controlled environment agriculture systems production, we have we consider inputs such as energy, water, carbon dioxide, fertilizer, and labor. On the other hand, we have outputs, edible biomass. Of course, that's our main uh, focus. But there's also non-edible biomass that can be converted into a valuable resource input through some processing. We can also recycle. Uh, the technologies are available now in controlled environment agriculture as we recycle nutrients and water. Uh, and that really enhances the optimal, that enhances the resources efficiency. We are also able to uh, capture or harvest transpired water and recycle that back into the system. So it can be used as part of the irrigation, for example, or maybe that water harvested from the environment can be used for another production system 
uh, in the controlled environment agriculture settings. So we really need to consider circularity, for example, and the ability to integrate systems so we are able to leverage the uh, outcomes, the outputs, and then convert them into resource inputs. The fundamental difference between a controlled environment agriculture and field agriculture system is that we have a complete control on both demand and supply conditions in a, in a, um, a controlled environment agriculture uh, setting. We can uh, improve uh, the control and management practices and strategies in CEA settings if we develop a, a strong understanding uh, around sensing and understanding of the plant and microclimate interactions so we can develop energy efficient and resource conserving control and management practices and strategies. If you look at a controlled environment agriculture system, here's an example of a greenhouse system. There are a lot, it's a complex system. There are a lot of processes that are happening at the same time. So a proper in a, a resources efficient control strategy must consider an orchestrated uh, approach around these uh, processes. So if you combine the greenhouse physics, for example, with crop physiological information, then maybe using plants, uh, it will be desirable to use plants as sensors, as a feedback mechanism, so we can improve control strategies and achieve resource use optimization. So my research uh, emphasis uh, has been around precision agriculture applications in controlled environment agriculture systems, mainly aiming to optimize resource use such as water, energy, and labor. So some of these research activities focused on computer vision applications, machine vision applications for plant health and growth monitoring and using plant uh, as a feedback, plant response as a feedback, such as speaking plant approach for environmental control applications, climate control strategy development for greenhouses and for indoor vertical farming systems, improving aerodynamics of greenhouses and indoor vertical farming systems using computational fluid dynamics approach, and also for crop production for space applications. I've also been focusing on uh, alternative energy or renewable energy applications, mainly with agrivoltaics. I'll, I'm gonna uh, kind of share with you some details about these uh, research programs. In terms of vertical farming uh, systems, uh, we have uh, several projects funded through USDA specialty crop research initiative programs. And one of them is the optimizing indoor agriculture for leafy green production. Uh, we have the Optimia uh, as the acronym for this project as we collaborate with our colleagues from Michigan State University, Ohio State University and Purdue. And we are really focusing on co-optimization of environmental variables so we can develop uh, control strategies to improve resource use efficiency. Our team focuses on uh, phytometric feedback-based decision support tools for optimizing vertical farm resources efficiency, computational fluid dynamics to uh, evaluate system designs around environment, uh, the aerial environment uh, uniformity uh, and uh, develop some recommendations uh, uh, for the industry uh, to optimize air distribution systems. And also we focus on uh, uh, tip burn, uh, lettuce tip burn uh, mitigation uh, in vertical farming systems. So with the computational fluid dynamics uh, work, uh, we really focus on alternative system designs for air distribution. Uh, Non-uniformity of the environment uh, has been a bottleneck of the vertical farming industry. If you imagine a three-dimensional large warehouse systems, uh, the ability to uh, bring that conditioned air into each layer uh, has been really limited and challenging. Um, we really would like to see a, a localized climate control uh, with proper air distribution system design so we can take that conditioned air and present that air into each layer 
so we can achieve the uniformity we want and also the desired ranges of, for example, air uh, velocity, air distribution, air current speed, as well as uh, CO2 levels and air temperature and humidity, VPD, vapor pressure deficit uh, uh, in, in the uh, canopy zones. And some of this work uh, has been published in textbooks. This is one of them, a Smart Plant Factory, the Next Generation Indoor uh, Vertical Farming uh, Systems. We've also been uh, looking into the comparison of uh, electrical energy use efficiency uh, for greenhouses versus indoor vertical uh, farming systems, uh, uh, considering various climatic zones around the world to identify uh, the, uh, the opportunities for greenhouses and vertical farming systems. And in this work, uh, we considered uh, six different locations, as you can see, based on their climate, some dry and cold climates, for example, Duluth and Seattle, some hot and really dry conditions in case of Phoenix, and uh, hot and dry, hot and humid conditions such as those in Miami and Abu Dhabi uh, cases, for example. And Riyadh is cold, uh, hot and dry. Uh, as we compare the energy use efficiency, electrical use efficiency uh, for growing uh, lettuce as the model crop in greenhouses versus vertical farms, as you can see, um, the the locations with high light intensity are still favorable. Uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, energy use efficiency uh, when you compare greenhouses or uh, vertical farms. So the greenhouses a lot, are a lot more efficient when it comes to electrical use efficiency. As you move towards the cold and cold regions and when the light is limited, you can see that the vertical farms are uh, at the same level in terms of the electric energy use efficiency. On the graphs, uh, the ones on the left are uh, uh, comparing uh, the efficacies of the LED lights used or the, uh, the number of tiers that are used uh, to compare the electrical use efficiency in vertical farming systems or the greenhouses systems. As you can see, there is very, uh, uh, there's a linear increase as you increase the number of tiers in a vertical farming systems and it's a result in terms of the energy use. We have also looked into um, the integration of economizer systems, the economizer uh, uh, environmental control strategies as you're able to leverage the outdoor, favorable outdoor conditions as part of the climate controls, for example, for cooling or for dehumidification, uh, which uh, uh, allows us to reduce the amount of energy used uh, with that sort of strategy embedded into environmental controls. We also looked into electrical use efficiency when we consider the amount of light intensity and daily light integrals for uh, growing lettuce crop in indoor vertical farming systems. As you can see, um, as you increase the daily light integral with increased light intensities, you can see the total energy use, of course, is expected to increase with also increased uh, yield. But when you consider the electrical use efficiency in terms of yield versus how much energy that goes into the production, that uh, ratio looks fairly similar uh, 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 among those uh, light intensities uh, considered uh, for the production. So at that point, one can consider uh, the profitability and also decision-making towards environmental controls so we can reduce uh, the energy use as well as the cost in terms of the production. Then next, you need to think about the marketing and uh, market and proper marketing scheme around uh, uh, pro providing this produce to the market in a profitable fashion. We are really we have been really into uh, uh, phytometric uh, feedback-based decision control and environmental control applications uh, with computer vision, machine vision, and modeling, predictive modeling embedded uh, uh, to the environmental controls. And here. One of my uh, uh, recent uh, master's student, uh, uh, Casey Shastain, worked on uh, this approach in a vertical farming system uh, using a modeling approach to predict the growth of lettuce uh, in a vertical farming system and also ex to explore um, uh, resource saving strategies, for example, around lighting versus CO2 enrichment. So the graph on the bottom right corner shows a scenario where we're able to enhance the 
CO2 and reach the CO2 to a higher level by reducing the light intensity to achieve the same amount of yield as you can see uh, going from 13 to 11 uh, daily light integral with CO2 levels from 500 ppm up to 1100 uh, ppm level to achieve 200 grams of fresh produce. Uh, with that strategy, we, we demonstrate that uh, close to 15% uh, energy savings can be achieved. So Casey uh, also looked into various what-if scenarios around carbon dioxide enrichment and the light intensity uh, control strategies from the transplanting all the way to the harvest with dynamic CO2 enrichment uh, compared to a constant CO2 enrichment, as you see in commercial applications uh, sometime from transplanting all the way to the harvest at the same level. Uh, uh, we also incorporated uh, uh, computer vision to monitor plant growth in real time. So we can uh, compare the real growth observed from the camera system, the computer vision system, versus what is expected under a given growing conditions with temperature, humidity, temperature, humidity, or CO2 levels of light intensity from the lattice. So mm -hmm. any deviation between the real-time monitored uh, observation versus the predicted model predicted uh, predictions for growth can indicate an anomaly or a problem where we can act, about, uh, act upon it to uh, uh, deviate from it and correct uh, the uh, the growth of the plant. As I mentioned, airflow has been really a bottleneck. So we are looking into, we've been looking into uh, the optimization of airflow, air distribution systems using computational fluid dynamics uh, approach. However, we are also uh, uh, validating those uh, uh, outcomes and proposed uh, design alternatives in an experimental setting. As you can see here, one of our master's student, uh, Chris Kaufman, is working on uh, a, a vertical airflow versus horizontal uh, airflow, horizontal airflow here, and the vertical airflow pushing air into the canopy to mitigate tip burn uh, issues. Tip burn is a calcium deficiency induced plant disorder that really minimize, that reduces the marketability of uh, lettuce crops uh, grown in controlled environment agriculture settings. In greenhouses, this has been effectively controlled with vertical airflow system, systems deployed on top of the canopy, so we can enhance the airflow and create a more dynamic flow around the plant, so the transpiration can be uh, enhanced uh, with calcium uh, taken up uh, at the levels that we want. Um, but in vertical farming, it has been a challenge. So we're really looking into improving this uh, with some design alternatives uh, and offer those possibilities to the uh, industry. Uh, we've been focusing on uh, agrivoltaic systems integrated to greenhouses. Uh, earlier work focused on opaque, um, uh, uh, non-transparent photovoltaic systems. Uh, that are positioned on side of the greenhouse to power the greenhouse system, the off-grid greenhouse concepts. Um, uh, later, we focused on uh, wavelength selective uh, covering materials with organic photovoltaic films, for example, and luminescent solar concentrate based, concentrator based photovoltaic systems to be able to produce food as well as energy within the same footprint of that greenhouse production system. I believe this will be the most sustainable way of uh, food production in greenhouses as we move uh, into the future. Uh, these technologies are advancing. Uh, they offer unique opportunities for such integration. There are some of these technologies are still in research phase, uh, but uh, uh, hopefully the cost will be reduced and practicality of installations will be improved uh, for greenhouse production um, in, uh, in the greenhouse system uh, applications. Uh, we have currently uh, projects funded through uh, National Science Foundation as we are working with our indigenous communities here, particularly the Navajo Nation, for example, as part of this project collaboration. We are trying to address their challenges when it comes to access to water and energy. 30-35% of the community members in our indigenous communities lack access to potable water and energy, so we are focusing on uh, off-grid greenhouse systems with photovoltaics as well as off-grid uh, nanofiltration uh, based uh, water treatment systems um, uh, for potable water. Uh, and we are trying to uh, train them, educate them uh, with these technologies. 
another project from NSF is also focusing on transforming rural urban systems uh, for sustainability in the inner mountain west. Again, our emphasis around these technologies as we collaborate and educate uh, our uh, work with our indigenous community members. Uh, we were recently uh, funded uh, from uh, USDA SCIR programs uh, on a project called uh, Advancia, Advancing Controlled Environment Agriculture Through Data-Driven Decision-Making and Workforce Development. Uh, this is the project uh, as we are collaborating with uh, uh, Dr. Yu, thank you, Yu. I'm really excited about it. So our emphasis is around autonomous greenhouse concepts as we bring more data and more plant-centric decision-making and environmental controls with computer modeling, artificial intelligence, machine learning based, uh, crop growth and greenhouse environmental controls. And uh, we are really looking forward to uh, uh, working with our uh, uh, wide range of stakeholders. And also uh, we will be developing educational modules that will be uh, provided to um, those who are uh, interested in learning about uh, environmental controls and uh, controlled environment agriculture uh, applications. Uh, as I mentioned before, we are really focusing on integrated and circular systems as we can maybe connect two systems and look into inputs and outputs. Here's an example of that as we worked on mushroom production where you have excess amount of uh, surplus amount of CO2 available and that can be used in a plant production system, leafy greens on the other side, and we can harvest humidity and water, actually water from the environment and bring it back to the system, for example, to enhance relative humidity uh, in the mushroom uh, production system. Um, automated crop diagnostics, uh, decision support, computer vision, mission vision are among the uh, emerging automation technologies in greenhouses. So they are really advancing uh, with these applications. We also see uh, robotics really advancing uh, with their practical and cost-effective ap applications in uh, controlled environment agriculture systems in greenhouses, but also technologies available for vertical farming uh, deployment. Internet of Things, uh, cloud-based services for data access and management are among also automation and uh, emerging technologies. Uh, I see great potentials uh, in terms of uh, augmented reality and virtual reality integration to control the environment agriculture system for educational purposes, for e-advising, remote access, and technical support uh, purposes, or sometimes for autonomous control uh, purposes. Artificial intelligence uh, is, uh, is uh, another um, uh, tool and uh, that can uh, uh, empower the plant as well as uh, the growers. Uh, I don't think that artificial intelligence will, will replace uh, the growers, but it will be an effective and efficient tool uh, really to improve our abilities and capabilities for environmental controls and resource use optimization. As we focus on engineering and technology uh, advancement, I strongly believe that we will need improvements in terms of the genetics and breeding efforts uh, because we need varieties that are suited for or crop varieties that are suited for uh, growing crops in, in, in greenhouses as well as in indoor vertical farming systems. There are a lot of uh, uh, research ongoing and advancement going on uh, in this area. As we have been focusing on um, food production in terrestrial applications with greenhouse and indoor vertical farms, we also need a, a, a innovation and advancement for crop production for space applications in the microgravity settings of the space station, for example, as we have been working on that with uh, funding from NASA in the past year or so, but historically we have more than 10 years of uh, program history focusing on biogenerative life support systems uh, to produce food and sustain life in space settings as our aim is to colonize space and then the moon and the Mars. Um, I strongly believe that uh, we need a, a skilled and educated and trained, well-trained workforce that are who are in high demand right now from our industry. Uh, so we will continue our focus uh, on educating and training the next generation farmers and uh, scientists and engineers and leaders of the Controlled Environment Agriculture Center. This is an area also your university is uh, really strong. You have funded projects. Dr. Neil Metzen leads uh, several projects uh, from USDA and uh, NSF around this. Uh, so we are really looking forward to our collaborations 
uh, with this emphasis on workforce uh, development. So with that, um, I would like to uh, 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 hopefully have some time to uh, answer your questions. Again, thank you for the opportunity uh, to be with you and present to you today. All right, thank you, Mirad, for that wonderful talk. Um, definitely covering a lot of areas, so that's all very exciting. I see there's a question in the chat. I'll start thank you. that first to get us started. Uh, so Dr. Feng Shi Yu says, uh, this space farming topic is very interesting. What do you think are the main challenges for CEA in deep space? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, uh, if you look at the history of uh, crop production in space, the space agencies, uh, you know, have been working on this area for many, many decades, and they did a fantastic job, you know, technology innovation, and some of the actually systems and technologies that we see right now with LEDs, environmental control sensors are coming from such efforts that are applied in now in terrestrial greenhouse applications or CA applications. Uh, however, they still identify and they still would like to see improvements, you know, advancement around, for example, uh, the, the uh, uh, on efficient uh, water and nutrient delivery systems um, uh, uh, for crop production in the microgravity setting of the uh, uh, International Space Station. That was the funding actually for the phase one grant that we received, uh, you know, um, and, and kind of working towards that challenge uh, among five other teams funded. Um, so that is a challenge. Uh, water reacts differently in that uh, microgravity environment, salt building up in the growing a zone uh, with the growing media within the growing media. That's a challenge. The lack of convective uh, airflow or convective forces uh, around the plant canopy is a challenge. Uh, hypoxia, the lack of oxygen in the root zone, is another challenge. Um, being able, you know, the a, a growing media that can be actually um, prepared on in situ is another interest because right now the growing media is shipped from Earth to space locations and then and then using that. And that becomes a waste that you need to manage later on. So these are the kind of challenges that we see, but also systems that are able to, uh, you know, uh, we can scale up, for example, uh, for uh, increased uh, yield and, and of course, uh, quality attributes and nutrition that we see. So those are the challenges uh, that we are trying to address. That's great, thank you. And I think question from Neil, okay. Uh, Mirat, I enjoy your following, mm -hmm. I enjoy following your energy modeling work in vertical farms. Do you see a future pathway towards cost-effective carbon-neutral vertical farms through a combination of energy savings and renewable energy? Uh, for sure, definitely. Uh, so we need to look into, first, the appropriate and improved system designs, the engineering of the systems. And, you know, when it comes to, you know, the lighting, lighting fixtures, efficacies, and, and uh, proper environmental control applications. The system designs that enable such energy savings, you know, how the systems are designed, production system designs, basically, uh, we need to consider that. So uh, on top of that, I think we will need to look at, you know, microgrids, uh, you know, renewable energy integration to uh, vertical farming systems and their availability and accessibility to those uh, energy resources uh, will be uh, a key. Uh, we literally need to look into uh, uh, the waste recovery. I think that will also allow us to develop, you know, uh, um, optimum and uh, sustainable systems uh, for vertical uh, farming. In some cases, we will be able to generate additional uh, energy uh, as we look into that circularity uh, so we can achieve or improve, you know, reach to a cost-effective uh, carbon neutral or close to that vertical farming operations. Okay, that's great, thank you. And Timothy Mount uh, asks, uh, please, will you discuss input needs such as fertilizer and pesticides, uh, I guess, uh, in terms of fertilizer use efficiency? Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, the plants need specific nutrients, as you uh, can imagine, you know, the, the, uh, there are 16 of them, the macro and micro elements needed for an optimal plant growth. Uh, in a controlled environment, agriculture systems, uh, you know, uh, circulating system, recycling systems are used, such as deep water culture, floating raft systems, nutrient film technique systems, and drip irrigation systems, as we are able to recycle and leverage those, you know, uh, nutrient water. Uh, so that really enhances our ability to uh, save from resources 
uh, really for a sustainable food production system there. Uh, in terms of the pesticide use, we try to minimize that and eliminate that actually with integrated pest management applications using beneficial, for example, insects, uh, you know, to deal with those that are creating the pressure and challenges in a controlled environment. Our ability to control the environment allows us to minimize the pest and insect infestation so we don't have to use uh, uh, pesticides. So those are the kind of uh, abilities that uh, we have uh, in our reach in controlled environment agriculture uh, systems. And uh, Peng Shi asks, uh, adding to Tim's question, would organic waste and CEA be a challenge uh, on earth and in outer space? Um, uh, there might be challenges, but uh, you know, uh, I believe we need to consider all possible ways to, to utilize the waste streams, you know, that are not, uh, that are, uh, that we see. Um, sometimes the inedible portion of the plant can be converted into a, a fertilizer or maybe um, another energy source. So there's a lot of emphasis around it right now in circular systems, biocircular economy, right, on earth and terrestrial applications. Um, ASABE, you know, has been looking into this uh, right now, uh, trying to develop a roadmap for us to focus on that with research and um, commercial applications in advanced that technology and integration. Uh, but for space applications also, can we use the waste streams uh, and then um, be able to utilize them as uh, resource inputs? Um, uh, the, the focus there around biorechange life support systems really uh, in the space applications is, is more advanced. So we're really trying to look into those and their applicability in earth-based systems. Uh, the, you know, the plants are being considered uh, other protein sources, such as, for example, edible insects uh, are being considered, for example, mushroom mycology is considered for, uh, for degrading waste and converting them into uh, resource input. So we are really looking into that for earth-based uh, system applications. Aquaponics is another one, right? Another example system is you're able to leverage waste uh, from uh, aquaculture and then be able to utilize that for leafy green production or plant production in a controlled environment agriculture system. So those are the kind of uh, interesting applications. Yeah, that is very interesting. So uh, Norman Scott uh, mentions that the hype on vertical farms has become greatly challenged. As Hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've gone out of business. Isn't there a need to shift to more valuable crops than leafy greens? Um, uh huh. So yeah. Uh, sure, sure. Dr. Right. Scott, it's very <laughs> nice to see you. Likewise, <laughs> Murat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dr. Scott is an idol and role model for uh, everyone in our uh, engineering field. Very nice to see you. Uh, yeah. So, as I mentioned, the vertical farming uh, industry uh, is an evolving technology platform. And it's not going to stop. It's going to evolve. And hopefully we will support that industry. Uh, there is a need for engineering side of it. There is a need for plant sciences, you know, uh, support for that industry. Genetic breedings, I think, will enable uh, us further in terms of the resource use. Um, uh, the focus uh, has been around leafy greens, microgreens, you know, with uh, short cycle crops. So we can really produce a lot more produce, you know, in a small uh, uh, footprint uh, throughout the year, but now there's the interest in terms of other crops, other alternative of fruiting crops, strawberries, other types of berries, uh, pharmaceutical crops. Uh, so the industry is really putting a lot of emphasis on that. We will see that diversity coming into the vertical farms. They are already, we already see that uh, growth in that industry. So it's going to take, you know, the integration of science, engineering, new varieties, you know, uh, to further that uh, industry and and really uh, help improving uh, its uh, profitability. Uh, but in some cases, we will see integration of greenhouses with vertical farms. Uh, we really need to focus on the market. What's the market? What's the market potential? The expectations of the consumers, because they are really looking for high quality, consistency, and nutrition. And those have been the challenge with produce coming from outdoors and fields. And that's what the you know uh, the retail stores are uh, asking for. So uh, I don't mean that you know CEA will solve everything, all the you know uh, challenges, but I think it will be a significant player as we try to address those challenges, both with greenhouses 
and also with vertical farming systems. Um, and John Abel asks, uh, what is the status of commercial implementations with respect to investment and profitability? Uh, I guess the status before and after uh, the trough of disillusionment uh, or CEA, there was a lot of uh, divestment from that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, there are uh, some operations now. They are still expanding. They are able to uh, ex uh, uh, interest the investors uh, in the sector, especially in vertical farming uh, uh, sector. Uh, scaling up is a need uh, and being able to produce high yield and quality is, is a must. Uh, and of course, with a price that is, you know, really um, comparable and attractive for the retailers and consumers. I think that's where we, this, where we see the growth and, uh, and development there. Uh, there are some operations. Uh, uh, they seem to be profitable. There are some that are being challenged. And uh, uh, I think they're looking into how they can improve uh, uh, that uh, around those challenges. Uh, but again, vertical farming is an energy uh, resource intensive production practice. And those are the things that you know uh, we're focusing uh, uh, with research uh, activities, uh, as well as um, workforce. Uh, you know the need for labor and the accessibility of labor with you know uh, workforce who, who who has an understanding and strong understanding and ability around uh, the signs of it uh, with the crop production and engineering. Uh, those are the things that we really uh, should focus on. To right. support that industry. And a good follow up on this is uh, Giselle Mello asks uh, For the entrepreneurs interested in having a CEA business in New York State, what do you see as the highest cost that they would uh, constantly have that needs to be optimized? Is it electricity, uh, mm -hmm. labor? Yeah. That's yeah. If you look at any type of uh, controlled environment uh, agriculture system, uh, the three, uh, you know, uh, top two or three uh, input cost is around uh, labor and uh, energy. So depending on the location, it could be energy for uh, lighting, it could be for heating or cooling, uh, but those are the top two uh, uh, high costs that uh, one needs to consider, labor and energy. And the rest is you know, other things uh, like fertilizers and other uh, cost of the technology investment and other things. <clears throat> uh, we have two more, uh, let's see. Are any of these systems designed for low-cost food production uh, appropriate for the global south? Yeah, I mean, low, te low technology CEA uh, is available, and one you know must consider uh, what is the expected outcome. If the technology is low, low tech, our ability to control the environment is limited, and that corresponds to a given yield and uh, quality outcome. So, if your market, if your expectation kind of aligns with that, then we can go for the low tech system. But if we are looking for a, a, a you know, a, 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 an outcome where you need to really maintain and achieve a high yield and uh, consistent qualities and uh, quality attributes, uh, and if that's the market demand, then we need to properly uh, select the technology and integrate and, and be able to use that technology in an effective way. Uh, you sometimes, you know, you may have the technology, but being able to operate that at the, you know, optimal level is a key. And that comes through the technology and also labor or the workforce that is able to control and operate that technology. So uh, some decision making is needed when you consider all of these, you know, outcomes, expectations versus technology selection and integration. Great. And uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, and I think this is referring to your work on agrivoltaics. Um, so do you see any benefit utilizing PV structures for and integrating them with IoT for crop monitoring? Oh, for sure. Yeah. So these are really unique uh, technologies that are advancing, uh, you know, ability to uh, tune the wavelength. And that's what we are exactly doing, you know, with the uh, LEDs. We are trying to explore space, certain spectrums and its effect on quality and yield. So in a similar sense, you know, that's the interest in photovoltaics, uh, luminescent concentrator base or organic photovoltaic films. Uh, so you, you have that ability, but you also are able to produce the energy for that greenhouse uh, uh, system. So uh, we will see some developments there. Uh, in terms of integrating IoT, 
and uh, crop monitoring. That's uh, that would be a beautiful integration, right? As we try to better control or, or you know monitor the system, not only the crop but also the greenhouse production system, for example. So we can um, uh, improve the controllability of the system, uh, power management, uh, right? Uh, coming from the PV system and its uh, um, uh, uh, the energy uh, uh, transfer to the uh, uh, food production system in the greenhouses, being able to predict the you know weather or do some modeling, for example, around the climate and the expected power outcome from a PV system and how we can use it uh, in an optimal way in the crop production system. Uh, those are the kind of decision making, you know. Uh, uh, is, uh, applications that we would definitely see uh, being able to shift, for example, the energy use, the uh, environmental controls throughout the day, availability of the source, the pricing of it, you know, coming from the PV system or other energy sources are going to be um, the, uh, actually the most uh, uh, appropriate and, and, and um, sustainable ways we can integrate uh, those technologies. Okay, great. Thank you. And I should have done this before, but I want to open up the floor uh, to everyone that's attending in person for questions. Does anybody have a question um, they want to add? Okay. Oh, yeah. So I actually asked the question in the chat. I wasn't sure if we were going to get to the room. Um, so I asked in the chat, but I was actually asking about ground mounted agrivoltaics um, where crops are grown like around solar farms. Mm -hmm. So. You talked about the greenhouse agrivoltaics, yeah. um, obviously where the PV panels are mounted on the greenhouse. But do you see any benefit to utilizing solar farms, you know, where they're on fields sure, um, sure. to control the microclimate for crop production? Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, I think that would be another alternative uh, in systems integration. Uh, uh, we can provide a, a comfortable environment for certain crops as long as you know the yield is not uh, sacrificed uh, to a limit that becomes unprofitable, um, if we can enhance the uh, crop growing environment with such agrivoltaic deployment, I think that uh, is something that we should consider. And these are being considered and uh, actually practiced right now. Uh, so the power production, the energy production within that same footprint is is also an advantage. I think there we need to look into you know, what makes sense, what is practical, what is profitable, what crops can be grown, and uh, strategic deployments of these systems, either fixed or maybe mobile, um, and uh, how they are deployed. Uh, will they enable uh, and allow uh, agricultural equipment to go in there and then prepare the land and process the land, you know, manage the crop in that environment? So there's some uh, logistics that needs to be considered. And the other uh, part of that uh, consideration or integration is, um, uh, you know, what the the permitting, uh, the coding, and who owns the 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 the, the PV system uh, versus who owns the you know the field. Sometimes you see that the there's an owner for the the crop and the land, and uh, the operator owner of the PV system. So there are some regulations and guidelines and protocol kind of needs to be in place for an effective. Uh, deployment and operation of an agrivoltaic system for outdoors. Um, but hopefully we will see those uh, improving and uh, making that integration more profitable and practical. Practical. All right, and uh, I'll just end it with one last question, unless anyone else here has a question. They thought of. Okay, um, so how much will advances in computer vision and sensing techniques affect uh, the three following areas, environmental controls, disease and pest management, and scientific exploration. All of it. Oh. No. You know, uh, um, I think these are the kind of technologies that we would like to see to, uh, to really help the grower or to help the uh, environmental control system uh, uh, to improve crop production, to improve resource use. Um, uh, these are the systems, you know, technologies, they don't get tired. They are advancing. They can understand the plant, their behavior. Uh, 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 of course, there are some challenges that we are trying to address. You know, how many of these sensors we need to deploy, where to deploy, what are the accuracies, what are the sensitivities, uh, uh, their ability to model, you know, predict the gro crop growth and disease occurrences, for example. Uh, 
you know, speaking plant approach uh, has been around for uh, several decades. You know, that uh, approach, that strategy actually uh, initiated back in uh, 60s, I believe 40s, uh, late no, 50s, late 50s, 60s, early 60s. So the challenge back then was the cost and computational capabilities of these sensors, instrumentation and modeling. Right now, those are really low cost. Right now, uh, the challenge is our the system's ability to differentiate, for example, stresses. So when you look at a plan and try to identify nutritional deficiencies, there are some commonalities, uh, you know, uh, 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 in terms of the deficiencies that you see or toxicities when you consider fertilizer, for example, use. So um, now we're trying to manage that through machine learning, and that needs a lot of data, data, you know, introduction to a model or a machine learning system, but uh, that is advancing. So our ability to do such things are advancing. Uh, so we will see in the short term, the collaboration of machines and machine learning robots and humans. And I think we will see further development in terms of the autonomous systems implemented into greenhouses and uh, also in the vertical farming systems. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, and I, I recently found a paper from you and Dr. Peter Ling from 2005 yeah. in, this, in this area. So I'm sure it's been around and now mm -hmm. it's to, uh, to continue that with the computation. All right, okay, I guess thank you. That, uh, we will end here and we can thank uh, Dr. Mirat Kachira one more time. Thank you, everyone. I wish I was there with you. Uh, hopefully, in the future, we'll uh, have another opportunity. I really would like to hear from you and see what you're doing and what you're working on. And I'm looking forward to our collaborations with Dr. Yu and, and continue our collaborations with Neil and, uh, and hopefully with some of you as well. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Murray. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate great. it. You have a wonderful day. You too. Have a great one. Take care. Bye-bye. Nice Thank you very much for the opportunity. Bye-bye.